Thank you for joining us today for our webinar for parents on the early introduction of allergenic foods to prevent food allergy. I am Jennifer Gertz, the Executive Director of Food Allergy Canada, and I have with me Dr. Alyssa Abrams. Before we get started, I just wanted to note a few housekeeping items. First, all participants are muted so we can keep the audio clear for the webinar. If you have any questions during the presentation, please submit them in the chat question box throughout the webinar, and we'll try to get to as many of those questions as we can. This webinar will be recorded and shared on foodallergycanada.ca afterwards, if you want to refer back to it again. And we'll have another webinar in June on this very topic, specifically for healthcare professionals that will be presented by Dr. Edmund Chan, one of the co-authors of the new Canadian Pediatric Society guidance. We'll share the details on how to register for that webinar in the upcoming weeks. We'd like to start off today's presentation with a quick poll to see how many people that have signed into the webinar and our audience would introduce allergenic foods to a four to six month old infant. And we'll then go back to that at the end of the session. So if you would take a few minutes to uh, answer that, uh, select an answer. All right. I'm not, have we got some updates on that? Okay, so what we have here is we've got almost 60% of the audience saying yes, 30% uh, no, and some unsure. So we'll come back to that at the end. And we also, just so you know, we'll be sending out a survey after the webinar where you can provide us with more input on your comfort around early introduction. This feedback is really uh, critical for us because it allows us to understand where the concerns are and it helps inform the medical community on how they would better support you with this effort on introducing uh, allergenic foods in infancy. Now I'd like to introduce Canadian pediatric allergist, Dr. Alyssa Abrams. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics section of allergy and clinical immunology at the University of Manitoba, and is a co-author of the newly released Canadian Pediatric Society Practice Point on the introduction of allergenic foods. She is also the vice chair of the Amphylaxis and Food Allergy section of the Canadian Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology, and the president of the allergy section at the Canadian Pediatric Society. So Dr. Abrams, I'd like to turn it over to you. Hi everyone, thank you very much for virtually turning in today. I'm going to be talking about understanding the updated guidance on early introduction of allergenic foods. Now just as another brief take-home message, this presentation is really for information purposes only and it's not meant to constitute specific medical advice for any specific individual situation because situations can be quite unique. If there's any specific medical concern about a child or about somebody in the family with food allergies, it's really best to speak to your physician for specific concerns. The goals of this presentation are to cover a series of common questions that parents and families ask about food allergy. We're gonna talk about how common food allergy is, whether it's increased, what contributes to food allergy, and then I'm really gonna spend the bulk of the time going through the new Canadian Pediatric Society guidance on how to introduce allergenic solids, in particular to at-risk infants, and give some practical tips around this guidance. The final slide will be a few take-home messages for families about food allergy prevention. Let's start with how common are food allergies. Food allergies are very common in North America and have increased over the past few decades. A study across Canada showed that about 8% of Canadians, and this was both children and adults, reported that they had at least one food allergy. And if you're looking at the indirect effects of food allergy, it's been shown that food allergy indirectly affects up to 50% of the Canadian population. In addition, there has been a rise in food allergy over the past few decades. For example, for peanut, there has been somewhere between a doubling and tripling of peanut allergy 
over about a decade in duration. Now we're going to talk about what contributes to the development of food allergy. Now this is a busy slide and I don't really want you to focus on the left hand side. We're going to talk really about three points on the right hand side. So various things can contribute to the development of food allergy. It's thought that the sun helps protect against food allergy. So for example, there have been studies that show that if a baby is born in the winter, they're more likely to have food allergy than if a baby is born in the summer. It's also been shown that children are more likely to have food allergy the farther they live from the equator. It's also thought that part of the reason that we've become more allergic over the past few decades is related to what we call the hygiene hypothesis or the thought that as we become cleaner our immune system skews towards an allergic response because it's less busy fighting other things like infection. Now finally we're going to talk about the dual allergen exposure hypothesis and I'm going to talk about this a little bit on the next slide. This theory really relates to why we now want to feed infants, especially higher risk infants, allergic foods earlier in life. So this is the dual allergen exposure hypothesis. It's a really fancy way of saying that basically eating foods protects you against allergy while seeing foods on the surface of the skin promotes allergy. So to go into a little bit more detail, Basically what this says is, your gut or your GI tract is used to seeing weird stuff. It sees weird stuff all day long. And in fact, it's what we call a tolerogenic immune organ. It actually teaches your body not to mount an allergic response. So if a baby eats a food and sees it through their GI tract, the allergy cells through their GI tract don't react and that effectively teaches their body this isn't something you want to react to. Now in contrast, if you see a food through your skin, especially in children with eczema who have less of a skin barrier and more inflamed skin, there are allergy cells that sit right under the surface of the skin and when you're exposed to foods through your skin, your allergy cells under the surface of the skin react and that effectively teaches the rest of the allergy cells in your body, this is a food to react to. This is a really different way of thinking about how we develop allergies, which has only come about in the past 10 or 15 years. So 20 years ago, we thought you became food allergic through your GI tract. And the theory at the time was, the older you are, the more mature your GI tract is. And therefore, if you're worried about the development of food allergy, it's actually better to stay away from these foods, allow your GI tract time to mature, and then when you see the foods through your GI tract, it's less likely to react. So this dual allergen exposure hypothesis which now shows that you become allergic through your skin, not your GI tract, is relatively new and has completely changed how we approach food allergy and food allergy prevention. Why do we think you become allergic through your skin? Now, I'm not going to go into all the medical studies. If you're interested in a lot of the medical research behind this, there will be another webinar by my colleague, Dr. Chan, that will go into this in a lot more detail. But basically, there have been lots of studies that show that children who are, avoid foods, they avoid eating foods, but are exposed to these foods in the environment, are at higher risk of food allergy than children who start eating allergic foods when they're very young. And we do know that food allergic proteins are present in our environment. So children do see them, quote unquote, through the surface of their skin. Now I'm only really gonna give you one example 
of a study that showed that eating early protected against food allergy. And this was the LEAP or learning early about peanut study. And it was a real leap forward in our specialty. What this study did was it took 640 infants who were considered to be at high risk of peanut allergy, either because they had really severe eczema or because they had an egg allergy. And what they did is they divided them into two groups. Group one, started peanut in infancy and ate it three times a week, starting between four to 11 months of age until they were five years of age. So they started early and ate it regularly. Group two completely avoided peanut until they were five years of age. And what the study found was that you could reduce peanut allergy up to 80% of the time by starting to eat peanut early in life and eating it regularly. Now, what you can see on the figure on the right-hand side is peanut allergy rates at five years of age in these kids. The dark green bars are the kids who completely avoided peanut until they were five or group two. The light green bars are the kids who started peanut in infancy. Within this study, they also divided the kids up into whether they didn't have a positive allergy test to peanut or whether they had a mildly positive allergy test to peanut. And what you can see is that there's a drastic reduction in peanut allergy in the kids that started peanut early in life, whether or not they had a negative allergy test to peanut or whether they had a mildly positive allergy test to peanut. As a result of the LEAP study, among others, there have been studies that have looked at early introduction of egg, of cow's milk, of grains, and also as a result of this new theory that really has a lot of evidence to support it, that we become allergic through your skin, but we can prevent allergy by eating these foods early I was part of guidance through the Canadian Pediatric Society that looked at the timing of allergic solids for infants at high risk. Now, the first take home point from this guidance is that we considered infants to be at high risk if they have allergies or if they have allergies in their immediate family. So an infant who had allergies would be, for example, an infant with eczema, or if they had allergies in their immediate family, it would be if they had any of the common allergic conditions, meaning asthma, allergic rhinitis or hay fever, food allergy or eczema in either a parent or a sibling. The next take home point from this guidance was, we said start these allergic solids at around six months, but not before four months of age. Now, when I'm talking about allergenic solids, I'm talking about what we call the top eight, or milk, egg, peanut, wheat, fin fish, shellfish, soy, and tree nuts. And tree nuts would be almond, hazelnut, cashew, pistachio, walnut, pecan, and Brazil nut. Now, I often get asked, why did you say around six? but not before four months of age. Because effectively, what we're saying is start these allergenic solids at between four to six months of age. There's a few reasons, but one of the main reasons was that the Canadians were not the first to put out guidance about when to introduce allergenic solids. And in fact, the Australasian Society of Allergy put out guidance about a year ago, looking at this is exact issue. And the wording they used was around six, but not before four months of age. And our goal as we move forward is as much as possible to harmonize what we say internationally so that the same recommendation is made from as many international societies as possible. And that's why we use the phrase 
around six, but not before four months of age. Take home point three. Once these allergenic solids are introduced, keep them in the diet on a regular basis. In the practice point, we said a few times a week because that is what the LEAP study did. However, practically, we don't really know if it has to be a few times a week, once a week, less than that, more than that. When I give advice in my clinic, I tend to say, once these foods are part of the diet, make sure they're integrated into your regular diet. And I would practically say at least once a week. This may be more important for some allergic solids than others, and it may not be possible to have all eight in the diet on a regular basis. If I were to focus on any, I would focus probably on egg, milk products like yogurt, peanut, and some of the tree nuts. The reason we make this recommendation is because there have actually been studies that show that if you eat a food once, it's not enough. You have to eat the food regularly, almost to effectively remind your body not to start reacting to it. And in fact, there have been studies that show that children who eat peanut and are fine with it, but then avoid it, are at risk of peanut allergy. Take home point four. Introduce these allergic solids one at a time. And the reason we say that is that those eight allergic solids that I talked about earlier account for almost all allergic reactions in young children. If a child has a reaction, and we're going to talk about how to recognize that later, you want to know what they're reacting to. So in particular, with these foods that are more likely to cause food allergy, make sure you start one at a time. We often get asked, how long should you wait between solids? And in the guidance, we said, without unnecessary delay between each new food. Now, practically, what does that mean? What I would tend to say is, if it's one of the common eight allergens that we talked about earlier, milk, egg, the nuts, the fish, wheat, soy, I'd wait two days between each new food. If it's a less common allergen, I think one day or so is likely fine. Next take home point, take home point five. Breastfeeding should continue with solid introduction. This guidance isn't meant to stop breastfeeding. It's meant to be adjacent to ongoing breastfeeding if mothers are able and willing to continue and doesn't change the current Canadian guidelines, which say that mothers should breastfeed for up to two years or beyond if they're willing and able to do so. And in fact, in a few studies, it's been shown that small amounts of allergic solids between that four to six month window really doesn't impact in any major way the amount of breast milk that a child receives. Take home point six. As with all solid foods, solid introduction should be based on developmental readiness. The infant should be able to sit without support, have good control of their neck muscles, hold food in their mouth without pushing it out on their tongue, show interest in foods while others are eating, open their mouth when they see food coming their way, and can let you know that they don't want food by turning their back to it. And this is common advice, not just for allergic solids, but for any solid introduction in an infant. Take home point seven. If infants are lower risk, meaning they don't have allergies themselves, and their immediate family doesn't have allergic conditions, the guidelines haven't changed. Wait for any introduction of solids until about six months of age. But then when you start introducing solids, there's no need to delay the allergic solids either. Those could be introduced around the same time. 
I often get asked about siblings of food allergic children by families who already have a child in the home who has, for example, peanut allergy. And they say, shouldn't the younger child who hasn't eaten peanut yet be tested because there's already a child in the house who is allergic to that food? Now there's a short answer and there's a longer answer. The short take home point answer is that no, it's not necessary to test younger siblings of food allergic children. Any child, whether or not they have a food allergic sibling, could be introduced to these allergenic solids between four to six months of age. Now, the longer answer is that some studies that were done in the past, some medical studies, did show an increased risk in siblings of food allergic children. But when you really look into these studies in detail, it's now thought that part of this risk is not actually that they're more genetically likely to have a food allergy, but actually that they're more likely not to eat these foods early in life. And we now know that eating early in life is protective. That's part of the reason. There's also a real challenge in doing allergy testing to infants in the absence of a reaction to a food. So there's two types of allergy tests that we can do. One is a skin test, where basically we take a little lancet, it almost looks like a toothpick, and we take a little bit of the protein from the food that we're looking at, and we basically prick it under the surface of the skin where the allergy cells sit, and we look to see if the allergy cells mount an allergic response. The other test, called the specific IgE test, is where we do a blood test and we look to see whether the allergy cells in the child's blood reacts to proteins in foods. But here's the problem. Allergy testing is very different from, for example, a chest X-ray, where you look at a picture and there's either a pneumonia or there isn't. There's a white ball or there isn't. Lots of people have positive allergy tests who eat those foods. And this is a really difficult concept to wrap your head around. But basically, a positive allergy test doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to react to the food when you eat it. And if you're more likely to have more allergy cells already, which for example, children who have allergies in the family are, you're more likely to have a positive allergy test that may be absolutely meaningless when it comes to whether or not there'd be a reaction when you eat. For example, there was a really interesting medical study that looked at siblings of food allergic children. And while it found that overall, yes, these children may be more at risk of reacting to something because of their family history, they were four times more likely to have a positive allergy test that was meaningless, meaning the test was positive, but they could eat the food. And as a result, it is possible that by allergy testing, we're labeling children as allergic when they may not necessarily be. And so a take home point here is that a positive food allergy test, whether it's the blood test we talked about or the skin test that we talked about, doesn't always mean clinical food allergy, meaning it doesn't always mean that the child will actually react if they eat the food. What are we saying about what to do in pregnancy or when breastfeeding? The current CPS guidance that was released this year in 2019 doesn't talk about this, but the Canadian guidance is unchanged from the 2013 guideline, which basically said mothers should eat whatever they want when they're pregnant, they should eat whatever they want when they're breastfeeding. And in fact, food avoidance diets can actually carry the risk of harm both to mom and to baby. So the take home point is don't stay away from any foods that you would normally eat when you're pregnant and or when you're breastfeeding. The next question is, which foods should be introduced 
early. You know, we talked earlier about those common eight allergens, but it can practically be very difficult to make sure that a young infant who's just learning to eat solids gets all eight of those allergic solids. So a little bit of practical advice here is that the best studies that have been done so far have looked at eating peanut early and have looked at eating egg early. So if you were to focus on any two, those would be the two that I focus on. There have been some studies that look at eating cow's milk early, and these would be cow's milk products like yogurt and cheese, not pure cow's milk, which is recommended to be avoided until nine to 12 months of age, and potentially wheat as well. But on the other side, there is no study that shows that avoiding any of the other allergic solids is beneficial. And we think that you become allergic the same way for all of these commonly allergic foods. Going back to that dual allergen exposure hypothesis or that theory that you become allergic through the skin. But there can be practical limitations to this, right? It's hard to get little kids to eat a lot of different solids. So if I were to focus, I'd say focus on peanut, egg, and then cow's milk products next. Now, a quick word about tree nuts and cashew in particular. As allergists, we're seeing more and more tree nut allergy, and in particular, cashew allergy. And it can be quite a severe allergy. So a bit of practical advice, even though it's not based on as many medical studies that I give the families in my practice, is also start cashew early. So an age-appropriate way to feed cashew would be, for example, a smooth cashew butter. Getting in to practical ways to feed allergic solids. For peanut butter, for example, you can take some smooth peanut butter, add some boiling water so that it becomes really, really liquidy, and then stir it until it's really well dissolved and well blended. Once it's cooled, mix it into a food the infant is already eating, such as cereal or pureed fruit, because you really want to make sure that the allergic solids, just like any solid, is not a choking hazard for infants. Now, another take-home point here is that allergic solids should never be the first solid that you introduce to babies, and that's for a very practical reason. When babies first start to eat solids, they sputter, they rub, they cough, they turn away, they stick out their tongue, and those are normal behaviors when babies are first learning to eat. If you start with an allergic solid, that could be taken as an allergic reaction, so it's best to know how the baby is eating, how the baby eats solids normally before you feed these higher risk foods. Now, an example of a practical way to feed egg or other allergenic solids is basically you can boil it, puree it, mix it up with a well-tolerated infant food. The take-home really here is that it shouldn't be a choking risk for babies. Because we know that, or we think, that you become allergic through your skin, it is never recommended to place the food on the surface of the skin. You know, there used to be that advice, we'll just rub it on the surface of the skin, see if there's a reaction. If not, the child will likely be okay eating it. Never do that. The baby should see the food first through their GI tract, and that goes back to this theory about how we think you become allergic. Whole peanuts are a choking hazard. They shouldn't be fed to infants or even young children until they're about four years of age. And in general, once a baby starts this food, it should be kept in the diet regularly as we've talked about, but there really aren't any absolutes about exactly how much to feed. Basically, keep it in the diet, give an age appropriate amount and feed it regularly if it's well tolerated. How do you know if you feed one of these foods and the infant is having an allergic reaction? 
Now, a bit of information about timing of allergic reactions. Allergic reactions are dramatic and fast. They tend to happen within about 10 to 15 minutes, and they tend to go away within less than 24 hours and often much faster than that. So if your child's having an allergic reaction to the food, they will react while eating or soon after, and the reaction will be completely gone within a day. The most common reaction that you see in infants or children of any age are signs on the surface of the skin. The most common of those is hives, and that's the top picture. Hives look basically like big mosquito bites. They're raised, they have a red exterior, they have a white sort of middle that's raised, and they're intensely itchy. They're very different from a flat, red, dry rash, for example, that you can sometimes see around the mouth of a child with irritating foods like tomato. The other skin sign that you can see is swelling, and that's the picture shown on the bottom. It tends to be swelling around the mouth and also quite dramatic. You can have breathing signs, and those would include coughing and wheezing. You can have tummy signs, and these once again tend to be profuse. Profuse vomiting, profuse diarrhea, like a blowout diaper diarrhea. You can have severe abdominal pain, but that's much harder to detect in an infant than it would be in an older child. You can have heart signs, like fainting and very low blood pressure but those are very uncommon in children and infants and tend to be very late signs after you've had many other symptoms. And finally, in particular for infants, there can be brain signs that your child is having an allergic reaction. And this would be while they're eating, there's a huge change in behavior, usually associated with skin signs, but they become very irritable, there's inconsolable crying, and they can cling to the caregiver. And that in combination with skin signs can help clue you to an allergic reaction, in particular in an infant. I often get asked, why have the guidelines changed so much? You know, 10, 20 years ago, we were saying, stay away from nuts until a child is three. And now we're saying, actively introduce these foods when they're an early infant. And I often get asked the question, you were wrong before. How do we know that we can trust you now? Now, the simple answer here is that we just know a lot more than we did 10 or 20 years ago. Over the past 10 to 15 years, we've learned a lot about a few things. Number one, when the guidelines came out that said, stay away from foods, as we've talked about, food allergy rates went up. They didn't go down. Number two, when the old guidelines came out, we thought you became allergic through your gut. And now there's lots of studies that show that you become allergic through your skin. And finally, over the past five, 10 years, there's been this wave of studies that have shown that eating early may have a protective effect, especially if an infant is at higher risk. Here are the concluding messages. If an infant has allergies themselves, like eczema, or somebody in their immediate family has an allergic condition, start allergic foods, in particular egg and peanut, somewhere between four to six months of age, when the baby is developmentally ready to start solids. Once it's introduced, and I would argue this is one of the most important take home points. Keep it in the diet. The guidance says a few times a week, but practically I'd say as long as it's a regular part of the diet, once a week or so, it will probably provide ongoing protection. It reminds your body not to react. For these higher risk foods, introduce them one at a time. Give a day or two between each new food. If a reaction is noted, the most common thing you'll see is skin signs. Stop the food, contact your physician. If no reaction is noted, 
keep it up. Food should be age appropriate. You want to prevent choking. This is not meant to take the place of breastfeeding. Breastfeeding should be encouraged until two years or beyond. And then finally, if an infant is lower risk, meaning they don't have allergies and there's no immediate family history of allergies, the guidelines haven't changed. Start allergic foods at around six months of age. And that concludes the formal part of this presentation, and I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you, Dr. Abrams. Uh, that was a very uh, informative uh, session, and we've got a number of questions that have come in. So um, let's get right through to those. First, there's a number of questions that relate uh, to specifically to um, introduction of the allergenic foods. And the first one is whether there is a recommended order to introducing common allergens to infants. Can you comment on that? Sure, that's a great question. And in general, no, there isn't. As I said in the presentation, I would never start with an allergenic solid. I'd make sure that the infant is used to eating solids in general. But once that's the case, it doesn't matter whether you start with milk products or egg or peanut, the order itself does not matter at all. Great. Okay, now this one related specifically to nuts. And the question is, should any nuts other than peanuts, almonds, almonds, cashews, and walnuts be fed regularly to prevent tree nut allergy? So that's a great question. And you know, we have less evidence for tree nuts than we do, for example, for peanut. If I were to focus on one tree nut, as we talked about, and as the question stated, I'd focus a bit on cashew, but there are eight common tree nuts. There's almond, hazelnut, pistachio, cashew, walnut, pecan, Brazil nut, sorry, seven common tree nuts. And what I often practically will say to families is do one at a time, but then if the child tolerates the tree nuts, you can, for example, make a muffin that has a little bit of Nutella, a little bit of almond milk, some age appropriate forms of the other nuts, stick it in the freezer, and once or twice a week, that's a snack for the child, just as a way of maintaining ongoing exposure to those nuts. Terrific. So this question relates to the introduction of fish, and this family doesn't normally eat fish in their house. Um, so they're asking whether it's something that they should be introducing it and how you would recommend if you don't regularly eat it in your family. Okay, so that's a great question. And I would say that finned fish and shellfish might be one exception to this rule. So finned fish and shellfish are a little bit different from the other allergies in children because you can become allergic to fish, even as an adult. And there really haven't been studies thus far that show that eating fish regularly in early childhood prevents fish allergy. Practically, while the guideline would put fish in that category of a food to be started early and fed regularly, I, I feel less strongly about fish than I do about some of the other allergens. And I tend to counsel a family to introduce fish when it would be culturally appropriate for them to do so. I wouldn't focus on fish as much as I would on some of the other allergens. All right, now this, uh, there's been a couple of questions that uh, relate specifically to the introduction of egg, egg. Now, can you speak to the importance of this and the approach for introducing this allergen? I know you touched on it, but maybe you can uh, give us some more perspectives on that. Sure, so there used to be in the guidelines, this theory that you stay away from egg white until a year. And that was really this allergy avoidance perspective. With introducing it four to six months, you would do the same with egg as with pretty much any allergenic solid. You could boil an egg, you can include the white and the yolk, mix it up, puree it up with breast milk or formula, mix it into a food that's already well tolerated. Egg doesn't have to be introduced before or after any of the other allergic foods, but because there's been some studies showing that introducing egg early is protective. I would focus more on egg than I would on some of the other allergic solids. Terrific. This one here relates specifically to milk allergy. And the question is to prevent a milk allergy, 
should um, it be in, the uh, infant be introduced to a dairy formula, formula shortly after birth instead of exclusive breastfeeding? So that's a really interesting and somewhat difficult question because you know there have been a few studies that show that intermittent or sort of ongoing exposure to formula starting early in life may have a role in prevention of milk allergy. But we know that there are so many benefits, both to mom and to baby, of exclusive breastfeeding, especially for that four, first four month of age window. So no, I wouldn't recommend formula supplementation in general. The Canadian recommendation would be to exclusively breastfeed early in life. All right. Um, in this question, uh, the, the person is asking, you mentioned that not starting with a common food allergen is, is what you should be doing. What would you suggest as a first food? So a good example is a pureed fruit or one of the infant oat cereals. Something that's basically pureed, isn't a choking risk, easily available, and isn't a common eight allergen. Practically, I'd say an infant cereal or a pureed fruit. Terrific. Okay, we're, uh, this question relates now more to the probability of having um, an allergy if a sibling has one. So uh, th in this situation, um, the question is, what is uh, the chance of a sibling of a dairy, of someone who has a dairy allergy in the family, that that infant will also have a food allergy? So that's a great question, and that hasn't been studied as well as siblings of peanut allergic children. Now, we know that there is somewhat of a genetic risk in general to the development of allergies. So if a parent has an allergy or if a sibling has an allergy, a child is at higher risk in general of developing an allergic condition. However, that condition doesn't have to be the same allergic condition as the family member. So for example, mother might have food allergy Child is more at risk of allergies in general, but doesn't have food allergy, has asthma or eczema or hay fever. So while there's a genetic link to some degree, there's also really a huge environmental role here. The one study that I talked about a little bit out of Chicago did show that food allergic children who have siblings, those siblings were at higher risk than the general population. As, as we've talked about in general, but the real risk in these siblings was being falsely labeled as allergic when they could actually eat the food. So even if there's a family member with milk allergy, the guideline would be exactly the same. Start milk containing products between four to six months of age. Great. Okay, I'm gonna move now to a group of questions that are more around understanding reactions and treating reactions. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, the question here is how to recognize if a baby is having an allergic reaction, if the baby has regular eczema or diarrhea. Okay, so um, I often get asked the question, you know, what about eczema and what about if eczema seems to flare a little bit with foods? My general perspective here is what I'm looking for as a sign of an allergic reaction is not eczema, but hives. So what I'm looking for on the skin is big raised welts that come quickly, that look like mosquito bites, that are intensely itchy and go away quickly. So if an infant has eczema, you can control the eczema. And in fact, there is some studies that suggest that control of eczema or early moisturization may actually be a really good thing when we're looking at food allergy prevention. But in general, my focus for the skin is not eczema, but actual hives or actual swelling. If a child naturally has looser poops, parents tend to have a sense of what the normal bowel movements of the child are. So there's a few points here. Number one, diarrhea related to an allergic reaction is profuse. It tends to shock families. It looks different from a normal loose stool. The second point is that in particular, when we're looking at these IgE mediated or anaphylactic allergies, it would be really rare to have diarrhea without other symptoms. So about 90% of all allergic reactions 
include signs on the surface of the skin, that would be another clue that there's an allergic reaction. However, at the end of the day, if there's ever a concern about an allergic reaction, it's best to seek medical attention and then speak to your physician. Great. So further on that, uh, around the question of hives, uh, this individual is asking, where would skin hives appear during a reaction? Is it on the face or can it be anywhere on the body? It can be anywhere on the body. So your allergy cells live under the surface of the skin, but they're all over your skin. It may be around the face, but it often can be all over the body. Now, if it is happening, children tend to be, or infants tend to be quite itchy. You'll know something's happening because they tend to become quite uncomfortable. This also leads to facial reactions a little bit uh, because it's important to distinguish to some degree, getting a little bit red around the lips, which is usually a flat rash that isn't raised, doesn't tend to be as itchy and lasts a few days, which is often irritation compared to these true hives, which are these big welts that can appear on the surface of the skin. Okay, and now if the initial reaction is hives only, does this indicate a lower chance of anaphylaxis in the future? No, it does not, and that's a really important point. So um, previous reaction severity does not predict future reaction severity. And a child can have mild reaction and have a much more severe reaction, or the converse, a child can have a very severe reaction on first exposure and then have a much milder reaction if they're exposed again. Any allergic reaction is considered to be potentially a life-threatening reaction, and our treatment or our management of that would be the same. Okay, so speaking to treatment, if you're introducing an allergen to a high-risk infant, you can use the dip. Can you use an EpiPen on them? For example, a four-month-old. So yes, you could. You know, epinephrine is a is a substance that your body produces naturally when you're having an allergic reaction, and when you use the EpiPen or the EpiPen Junior, as it would be in this case, all you're doing is supplementing what your body is naturally doing. When you use the EpiPen, it almost feels like a little bit of a shot of caffeine to the infant. You know, they'll become a little bit jittery, uh, they may become a little bit pale, but it is not dangerous to them. And there is no contraindication, meaning there's no situation where epinephrine cannot be used if there's an acute reaction to a food. All right. It sounds like we've got some kids in the background. It's appropriate for our early introduction. So this question is also related to allergic reactions. This question is, should parents have Benadryl on hand if they have family history of an allergy? So that's an interesting question. And, you know, Benadryl is our oldest antihistamine. So often it's the antihistamine that's readily available if families go to pick one up. However, in general, I say stay away from Benadryl. And the reason I say that, you know, when we talked about allergic reactions in infants, we talked about brain signs that an infant can have. And one of the brain signs is they can become really tired. Now, Benadryl is the only antihistamine that's readily available on the market now that usually crosses the blood-brain barrier and has effects in your brain. And it makes you really sleepy. So if you use Benadryl in an infant, who's having an allergic reaction, and the infant becomes sleepy, it becomes really hard to know. Is that infant sleepy because the allergic reaction is getting worse? Or is that infant sleepy because of the Benadryl? Now, there are other antihistamines available on the market, like Aries Kids, Claritin Kids, Reactin Kids. If an infant is having mild hives, like a few hives around the mouth, you can use an antihistamine, but a really important take home point is that if there's a systemic reaction, antihistamines should never be used before the EpiPen. Antihistamines help hives and hives only. Hives are not life threatening. The only medication that we have that is life saving in acute allergic reactions in children is the epinephrine auto injectors, or in Canada, the EpiPen. Terrific. Okay, now I know um, that this isn't a forum for specific medical advice, so you can feel free to refer this question on to um, this uh, this person's uh, um, 
uh, physician. With this situation, the baby is seven and a half months old and shows signs of being allergic, um, is throwing up with tummy pain to dairy. The, the question here is how should they proceed? Okay, so there are anaphylactic allergies, which was really more what this guideline or guidance was focused on. And then there's this whole other sort of grab bag of non-anaphylactic, non-IgE mediated allergies. And this guidance is really more to prevent the anaphylactic type allergy. Now, sort of ongoing tummy stuff may or may not fit more into that other grab bag of non-anaphylactic allergies. Any time a family is worried about a reaction to a food, it's really important that they speak to their physician because there are questions that we can ask about when these symptoms are happening that will give us a clue about whether or not it's related to a food. Okay, well, that's uh, it's interesting because we had another question come uh, about around um, early introduction in its ability to prevent other non-anaphylactic food allergies such as EOE. So can you further comment on that, Dr. Abrams? Sure. So the evidence here, the evidence that we talked about today, these medical studies are really looking at preventing what we call IgE mediated or those immediate potentially anaphylactic reactions to foods. We don't know what role eating early will have on the non-anaphylactic or non-IgE mediated group of food reactions including eosinophilic esophagitis or EOE. So no, it wasn't meant to comment on those other types of allergies, only on IgE mediated or anaphylactic, potentially anaphylactic food allergy specifically. Okay. The next grouping of questions relate to um, the uh, the lack of comfort or, or feeling some anxiety around the idea of feeding allergenic foods to babies. So I wonder if you can speak to some of the things that can address the fear or anxiety around kind of the probability of a reaction, like should we be feeding at home or, you know, they might actually have a, an allergy themselves or a sibling right. in the family. Maybe if you can speak to all of those pieces uh, um, for us, Dr. Abrams. Sure. So uh, it's understandably very nerve wracking to feed these foods, especially if there's an allergy in the family, because you've been sort of hardwired to avoid these foods. And so it's a real shift to try to now purposefully feed the foods and feed them regularly. There's a few points to know, though. Number one, there has never been a life threatening reaction on first exposure to a food in an infant. So these foods can be fed at home. They do not have to be fed at the pediatrician's office, in a car outside the emergency room. They can be fed in the home with a caregiver who's used to feeding the child. Another important point is that in general, exposure to these foods through smelling or through the surface of the skin is unlikely to cause a systemic life-threatening reaction. In general, those reactions only happen if you eat the food. And soap and water actually removes these allergens from the surface of tables, plates, etc. So you can feed the food at home, even if there's somebody else in the family who's allergic, as long as you're careful that you wash the surfaces as well as your hands after you feed the food. Great. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, did you one know more anything? Thing. Yeah. yeah, there was one more thing. I often have families who say to me, you know, I understand that, but I'm still really nervous. I have an allergy myself and I just can't wrap my head around giving that food in the house. And what I'll sometimes recommend practically in those situations, if the family has another caregiver who's available, who's not allergic, whether it be another parent whether it be a grandparent, a cousin, whatever the case may be, who's a responsible adult, that that adult be involved in feeding that child whatever the allergenic food is outside of the home so that there's less concern within the house. Terrific. All right, so here's another question um, where uh, the question is, is, is if a food allergy is potentially present early on, should we try and reintroduce food at some point in time, knowing that it could cause an allergic reaction? Okay, so that's an interesting question. 
And you know, there's been some studies recently, this is actually an interest of mine, on feeding infants or young children, preschoolers in particular, in a controlled allergy clinic environment, very small, minute amounts of the food they're allergic to, in particular, peanut is a big one, and seeing if we can get them to tolerate more and more of it over time. Now, it's an interesting research question, and some allergists, myself included, are doing that in a controlled environment in an allergy clinic. I would never recommend that a family try to feed a food that their child is allergic to at home. It can cause reactions, it can cause severe reactions, and our guidance is, if your child's been diagnosed with a food allergy, you stay away from that food. Now, there are some foods that are commonly outgrown, some food allergies that are commonly outgrown, for example, milk, an egg and wheat. And so regular reevaluation with an allergist is worthwhile because some of these allergies are grown quite regularly, but I would never try it out at home. Terrific. Well, I see we are getting close to our, our uh, the hour that we've allocated for this webinar. So I know we haven't got to all everybody's questions. Um, please note that we will be taking uh, note of all of those questions. We'll endeavor to answer those um, following the webinar. Um, now that we've had the chance to learn about this new guidance with your uh, insight and information, Dr. Abrams, I'd like to go back to the, the poll and see where we're at on people's um, ability or interest to introduce allergenic foods to a four to six month old infant. So if everybody could uh, take a look at that and, and select your answer on the screen. We're just waiting for those poll results. Wow, so it looks like we've been able to hit the mark in terms of providing you with the necessary information. Having said that, we would really appreciate if you would um, serve or uh, still fill out the survey that we're going to send you via email. Take a few minutes to complete it. Your feedback is crucial, and maybe you can help us understand the components that were very helpful to addressing, helping you understand and address concerns with early introduction. We'd also like to uh, um, ask you to consider making a donation to Food Allergy Canada. We are a, a national registered charity, and we do rely on your donations to support services for such as these for free um, and other ongoing educational web webinars. Uh, we'd also like to uh, thank our sponsors for their contribution to our webinar series. Uh, we've got Pfizer Canada, the Sean Delaney Memorial Golf Classic, the Walter Maria Schroeder Foundation, and the Pe Peanut Bureau of Canada. So thank you, Dr. Abrams, and thank you everyone for your participation in this webinar. We can you can view a recording of this webinar at foodallergycanada.ca shortly, and please also share this with others who may benefit from this content. This now concludes our webinar.